Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now there's no doubt that spirituality is all the rage in 21st century London. Runty Williams works as a business and strategy coach here in the city and I emailed Runty last week and asked her to write a brief piece for me on the self-worth, self-affirmation, self-improvement movement. And she responded with an outstandingly insightful piece. Self-worth, self-care, self-affirmation, self-improvement, she says, these are all part of the air we breathe. The idea that with our best efforts we can be our best self is very common. I googled be your best self and got 2,850 million results in 0.63 seconds. And Ronty continues like this, spirituality has been very much co-opted as a key part of the self-care and wellness movement. Eastern spiritual practices like meditation, often rebranded as mindfulness, have become mainstream in a way that they haven't been outside of California since the 1960s and 70s. Well, this makes Paul's letter to the Colossians of acute relevance to us today. I, I've become increasingly, I don't know about you, increasingly suspicious of any who seek to make any predictions about what our world is going to be like in 12 months' time. But one thing I think we can be sure of is that the self-actualization movement of which Runty writes will become hypercharged. Spirituality will be all the rage. We've had stripped away materialism, hedonism, individualism, and we can be sure that spirituality will be as vibrant as ever. Well, Colossae was a somewhat insignificant town inland to the east of Ephesus in the Lycus Valley. It had once been a great center, but by 60 to 62 AD, when Paul wrote, it was well past the glory days. One commentator describes the church in Colossae as probably the least significant church to which any of Paul's letters was addressed. Paul himself had never been there. The church had been founded by Epaphras, one of Paul's assistants. But following Epaphras' departure from Colossae, others had come in after him, and these others had suggested that something was lacking in Epaphras' work. Uh, we'll come to them later on when we get to chapter 2, but they seek to deceive the Colossians with fine-sounding philosophy and to disqualify the Colossian Christians by saying that uh, they aren't spiritual enough. They seek to discredit Epaphras and to discriminate against the Colossians on grounds on them not being sufficiently spiritual. These false teachers, as we'll call them, are super-religious. They demand adherence to special religious practices. They are super-strict, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And they are super spiritual. They claimed interaction with angels, among other things. And thus, as Paul writes from his prison cell in this, what you might call, lockdown letter from Paul writing from Rome, the Colossians, uh, he's seeking to shore up the Colossians um, and, uh, and to, to assure them that their faith is, uh, is, is real. 
And therefore we have emerging from this least significant of churches, one of the clearest and most developed expositions of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has achieved. It's one of the clearest expositions of what genuine Christian spirituality looks like in practice. I've called the series Total Faith. And I'm wanting us to see that in the Lord Jesus, we have been given everything we need for a fully fledged, truly spiritual walk with God. Well, three points in this talk. You are the real deal with real spiritual DNA. You have received the real gospel and born real gospel fruit. You are the real deal and have heard the real gospel from a real bona fide gospel worker. From the get-go, Paul's aim is to assure his readers of their authenticity. You'll notice that Paul calls the Colossians both saints and faithful brothers in verse 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. The word saint in the Bible never refers to a special or unique band of individuals. The word saint simply means a holy person. But in the Bible, every Christian believer has been made holy by the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he's done on the cross. And so the word saint refers to every believer who makes up the church. All of us are described as saints. And not only does Paul describe the Colossian Christians as saints, he also calls them faithful brothers. Remember, this is the great apostle Paul speaking to a group of people he's never actually met. And he calls them brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and so it's worth pausing. Do you trust Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Then you are Saint John, Saint William. Saint Micah, Saint Paul, Saint Martin, Saint Jill, Saint Jess, Saint Michel, Saint Jules. Now, I was studying on Zoom this passage yesterday with a group of bankers, and we looked around and said, Yes, yes, even us, this group of bankers, saints, every one of us, made holy by the Lord Jesus. But in verses three to five, Paul goes further as he is seeking still to persuade them that the Colossians, they are the real McCoy. Here, he tells the Colossians of his prayer of thanks for them, and he gives thanks for their faith, their love, and their hope. So verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. This key triad of faith, love, and hope are the essential hallmarks of any authentic spirituality in the New Testament. And so Paul assures them he's heard of their faith, of their love, and of their hope. But look at the way Paul frames it, and I think you'll see that it's quite unusual. He says, your faith and love that you have because of the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. The New International Version translates it like this, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. Do you know, I think if I was writing it, I would say, if because of your faith, so you have love for all the saints, and because of your faith, so you have hope in heaven. But Paul doesn't say that. He says, no, because of your hope stored up for you in heaven, so you have faith and love. Later in the letter, Paul writes, of Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that it's as a result of the Lord Jesus taking hold of a person and entering into a person through his Holy Spirit, that a person has absolute assurance and certainty about a future with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And from that confidence and certainty that has been produced by Jesus entering into us, so our faith is fed and developed. With Christ, our future is now absolutely, solidly secure with God. With Christ, we've been raised up and are guaranteed a future in glory. 
And in Christ, we are now heirs of a new future in heaven. And that's what makes Christian spirituality, genuine Christian spirituality, different to any other spirituality on offer. It's all been achieved by Christ and through Christ. We are secure in Christ and with Christ, seated with him in heaven, we're going to discover later on. And this then, this certainty and assurance, feeds our faith and our love, uh, our faith in Christ today and our spiritual uh, walk with him. So that it's not about me trying harder, engaging in more rituals and religion and taking on further spiritual exercise, a kind of Joe Wick's spiritual workout every day. No, it's all been done for me and I am now to enjoy and work out what he has already secured for me. This certain confidence of glory, hope of heaven, energizes further faith and love for all believers. I don't know if you've seen the US episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire when John Carpenter has had read for him the four questions that if he picks the right one, will see him win a million dollars. And you know how the lights zoom in on the contestant seated in the chair. And Carpenter is asked by the American host, Regis Philbin, if he, could, if he asks if he can use one of his lifelines. He's still got three intact, and this is the million dollar question. Uh, and so John Carpenter rings his parents. Uh, and in the 30 seconds that he's got, he simply said this, Dad, is that you? Yes, it's me. I want you to know I'm going to need your help. Okay, I've just won a million dollars. I need you to help me spend it. Absolute certainty, absolute assurance. It's a glorious moment. You can Google it. And from that point of sure certainty, that assurance, so our faith and our love flows out. And this is what makes this spirituality, gospel spirituality, so glorious. In Jesus Christ, we have been made saints. In Jesus Christ, we have certain hope laid up for us, stored up for us in heaven, a certain future. And in Jesus Christ, then, we are free to develop in faith and love for all the saints. And those seeking to undermine the Colossians are seeking to make the Colossians dependent in their faith on something other than what Christ has done. So eating or not eating, touching or not touching, attending certain ceremonies, not attending certain ceremonies, having supercharged spiritual experiences or not having supercharged spiritual experience. Here is Paul's point. You are the real deal with real gospel DNA. Already you can see that Paul's beginning to lay the foundations for what he's going to do later as he unpicks the bogus spirituality of the false teachers. But in verses 5 and 6, Paul continues with the same theme. You're the real deal with real gospel DNA. You've received the real gospel with real gospel fruit. Let's look at these verses closely. The second half of verse 5 and verse 6, and you'll see that this piece both begins and ends in the same way. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So you've received the real gospel and are bearing real gospel fruit. Now look closely at the second half of verse 5 and the end of verse 6, and you'll notice that Paul brackets what he has to say here with the word truth and with an emphasis on the Colossians having already heard the word of truth. So it's there in verse 5. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth the gospel, and it's there at the end of the piece, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So you can see the emphasis, the emphasis on the true gospel that the Colossians have heard in truth, and the emphasis on the fact that they've already heard it. 
It's as if Paul is saying something like this. Look, it may well be that some Johnny come lately has ridden into town with some newfangled additions to what you've been taught about authentic spirituality. But you heard what you needed to hear originally through Epaphras. And what you needed to hear, you heard in the gospel of truth. And what you heard in the truth of the gospel was the true gospel of God's grace. In other words, you're the real deal because you heard the real gospel. And of course, these words of truth were the words of Jesus Christ, which are the words of the grace of God. Grace simply means gift, God's riches at Christ's expense. And it's so brilliant that Paul puts it like this, putting grace and truth together, the two key features of the gospel of God that we find in Jesus Christ. We have seen his glory full of grace and truth. It is this free gift from God that assures us of our place in his family and of our certain future inheritance with the Lord Jesus that is the foundation of all authentic spirituality in the Bible. And it comes free of charge. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the good news of the grace of God in truth. God gives it to us. We don't have to earn it. It is true. It comes from him to us. He works it in us. Uh, and did you notice just how Paul put it in verse 5 there? It is the word of the truth of the gospel. Uh, what's so frustrating with all the religion of man is that it's all down to me. Exercises in self-actualization, endless rituals to discover the best me peeling back the onion skins to uncover my authentic self. This belly button spirituality, as I spend my time looking in at myself, well, it's, it's all about me. Whereas the truth of the gospel, as it comes to us, comes from outside, it comes from God. It's his objective truth. But, but if Paul brackets what he has to say with this emphasis on truth and grace and the gospel, which the Colossians have already heard through Epaphras, then in the middle part of these two verses, in the center of this sentence, he emphasizes that this gospel is the same gospel that is to be found bearing fruit all over the world. And this is a brilliant tactic on the part of Paul. Just look at the verses again. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard of it. We're going to discover later in this letter that super spiritual visions and encounters with angels and super religious ceremonies and rituals and super strict do not handle, do not touch and so forth is the hallmark of the false teachers in the letter. How easy in a remote part of what was known in Paul's day as Asia but is now Western Turkey for a group of spiritual wannabes to offer young Christians an additional spiritual recipe for power-packed, high-octane, life-to-the-full spiritual living. And that's how supercharged sects always work. We've discovered the secret to power-packed, prophetic, prosperity living. Come to us and you'll see it. Well, Paul pulls the rug from under the false teacher's feet by lifting the Colossians' eyes to look out to the ends of the earth. It has come to you as indeed the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing as it also does among you. In other words, this word of the truth of the gospel, it, it works everywhere. Uh, don't think that your local exceptionalism makes you any different. You see how Paul puts it? It's almost as if he's saying, look, take the camera and uh, on, with a drone, lift off from the backwater of Colossae and out down the Lycus Valley 
onto the river Meander, which makes its way windingly over to the west and uh, to the coast. And then go in and look at Ephesus, and you'll find exactly the same gospel bearing exactly the same fruit. And then up to Troas, and you'll find the same gospel bearing the same fruit. And then head further northwest to Philippi and Thessalonica, and then south to Athens and Corinth, and then come all the way over to my prison cell in Rome, and you'll find this gospel, this same gospel, bearing this same gospel fruit. Head east to Antioch, to Caesarea, to Samaria, to Judea, to Jerusalem itself, you'll find this same gospel bearing spiritual fruit and growing across the world. Don't think your local eccentricities, your local exceptionalism makes you any different. It's just this one true gospel. I have to say, my experience, my limited experience of travel, I found exactly the same today. It's this gospel, the gospel of the truth, of the grace of God, that gives us this sure hope of heaven that bears fruit and grows across the world. And in verses 7 and 8, Paul simply underlines the position of Epaphras. Just as you learn it, learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Well, what a beginning to a letter as Paul assures the believers in Colossae that they are the real McCoy, the real deal. That they've heard the real gospel And they're really bearing the fruit of the gospel, both in numerical growth and in spiritual growth and maturity. And that they heard the gospel from a real gospel worker, Epaphras, who had taken the gospel up the Lycus Valley to the church of Colossae. Well, just a couple of observations as we draw to a close and before questions. You know, for those of us listening who would call ourselves Christian, here is a plumb line in this letter to the Colossians, to hold up against our own spiritual experience. Already, I hope it will have confirmed for you that you're the real deal, that you are a saint because you put your trust in Jesus. He's declared you to be a holy one. That you have a hope that is steadfast and certain, no matter what the the virus may throw at us, that you are secure with him that you've heard the true gospel, and this true gospel is the gospel that's been bearing fruit across the whole world down through the centuries and continues to bear fruit today. Uh, For those who are exploring the Christian faith, just listen to how uh, Ronte finishes her piece. Remember, we began with these comments on spirituality. She says this, look, there is a sort of tyranny at the heart of much of this being your best self stuff that exposes how humanism, like all false religion, is not only deceitful, but cruel. If I falsely think that I can essentially remake myself to my own specification and in my own strength, the inevitable realization that I can't will be crushing and cause me either to double down or to despair. Well, here's a completely different spirituality. It comes from the truth of the gospel, the gospel of truth, the gospel of grace. It comes from outside. It comes as a gift from God who then brings to us in Jesus Christ a gift of membership of his family, a place in heaven. But then for all of us, the fact that this church in Colossae was started by someone other than the great apostle Paul, I think is really helpful. Paul's never been there. He's writing from his prison cell. But it enables us to check the gospel message, and if you like, the ministry of the messenger, from whom we heard the Christian gospel. As we go through, this will enable us uh, to, if you like, have a benchmark against which to check authentic gospel ministry. And it may well be that we will find ourselves, I include myself here, find ourselves saying, well, look, we just need to get slightly back in line at this point. And then finally, what an encouragement, I suspect, for many of us that, you know, Epaphras, who it may well be, you know, you've never heard of, Epaphras, this relatively unknown colleague, co-worker with the Apostle Paul, 
Well, he was sent down the road to Colossae. I don't know how he found himself there. But he started to teach the gospel, the true gospel. And here we have a true church with true Christian experience. And so whatever Christian ministry you are engaged in, this should give us great encouragement, it seems to me, that uh, even as we teach this gospel and share this gospel in our, in our firm, in our village, wherever it happens to be, so uh, we are engaged in something that is authentic from God. Allow me to lead us in prayer, and then there'll be a chance for questions. Gracious Father, we praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ that enables us to be declared, every one of us who trusts Jesus as holy, that you've washed us clean, and made us into your saints. Uh, we thank you that you have in Christ uh, provided for us a certain and sure hope. Uh, we are with Christ in glory as a result of his work, already in a sense. Thank you that this feeds our faith in Christ and our, uh, our love for believers. And we do thank and praise you, Father, for this gospel of yours that you have declared to the world, uh, that it's true, that it's a gospel of grace, not of works. And we thank you for those who have brought the gospel to us and ask that you would strengthen us in turn to bring it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've already got a, a, a couple of extra excellent questions, so thank you for sending them in. Here's the first one. How can I have 100% confidence of my salvation and the hope I have in heaven, especially when dealing with doubts such as my many daily sins and wavering belief? And in some ways, I think the kind of new pressures with the lockdown can expose whole areas of our own failure that we weren't quite aware of previously. Well, I think the answer is not to look at myself. And I think that's what Runty so helpfully has identified for us in what I call this belly button spirituality. And if I spend my life looking in at myself, then of course, um, I'm always going to be finding more and more problems and issues. Whereas what Paul does is direct our gaze outside of ourselves. So next week, make sure you tune in next week because next week we look at Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And you can see in verse 11, he says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of our, the, his beloved son. So it's, it's something that God has done. It's not something that you have done. And therefore, you can have 100% confidence in it because it is triple A rated, if you like, because it's his work. It's what he did through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Can you provide wisdom about how to respond with those who say that Jesus is enough? I don't need theology, the Bible, or other Christians. It's a personal relationship between God and me. Well, that, that I think is extremely helpful um, as a question to, 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 to open up for us. And I often come across that. It's really interesting, isn't it, that the Bible gives specific commands that we should meet with other Christians. And so I always say to somebody like that, uh, for example, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, um, tell us, let us not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some. Now, I know we can't meet together just at the moment in that way, but we can meet together virtually and so forth. But the Bible specifically expects us to meet together with other Christians. And the Lord Jesus, when he talks about the true vine and branches, he has in mind not just isolated twigs, but actually being, uh, if you like, grafted into the vine of, uh, of uh, the, the Lord Jesus and his work with other believers. So the whole movement of the Bible is away from individualistic kind of uh, me-centered spirituality to coming to the Lord Jesus and then being brought close to other believers at the same time. And if you like, the whole economy, the whole dynamic of the way encouragement and growth as a Christian works is through being brought to Jesus and to other believers uh, under his word. 
Uh, and and I, I'd want to explore one or two of those areas with, with the questioner. Verse 6 encouraged me that no matter what context I'm in and no matter where I am in the world or in history, I've got exactly what I need, both myself to keep going as a Christian and for other people to hear. Well, let's have a look at verse 6. Verse 6 says this, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. I think that's absolutely right. It's a really helpful comment. No matter where I am in the world or in history, I've got exactly what I need, both for myself to keep going as a Christian and for other people to hear. It's the authentic gospel of God's truth that has come to us in the scriptures. It's come from outside, and as it comes to us, so it makes us complete as Christians. But I like the, at the end of the question in terms where, where the questioner speaks about service and, and work amongst others. What I love in Epaphras is, you know, as I say, we may, some of us may, may have never heard of Epaphras. And yet, funny old Epaphras, this faithful minister, probably sent out by Paul from Ephesus when Paul was based in Ephesus, finds him his way into the Lycus Valley which is a tributary of the river Meander. He's now in Colossae, and he starts speaking the gospel, and it's Philemon who becomes a Christian there and uh, forms a church in his house. And here is Epaphras, who has started a work that we're reading about today. And, and that work has established secure and mature Christians who've got all that they need. That should be a huge encouragement to uh, to, to, to people in, the, in your businesses and so forth who are seeking to make Jesus known and encourage other Christians. How is Christian sacrificial living different to sacrificial living demanded by humanist philosophy? That is to say, Christians are also encouraged to strengthen their faith, love, and hope through spiritual discipline. To what ends? I think the big thing is that we are drawing on God's um, uh, sufficient power and enabling that comes from outside of ourselves. Again, I think that's where Ronti was so helpful. You know, the old business of peeling back the onion skins to find the true me, that is just old Catholic spirituality that you'll come across in all sorts of old circles. But it's just dressed up in new clothes. And it's essentially inward looking and the resource is coming from me. Whereas we're going to see authentic Christian spirituality, it the, the resource comes from outside, and the resource from outside is the true grace of God in the gospel, the word of truth. And, and, and his resource is unending and, and uh, all-sufficient. And Colossians has got uh, one of the greatest expositions of the sufficiency of Christ in the Bible. And we're going to be looking at that in a couple of weeks' time, so I hope you're here for that. I agree that Jesus is all I need for salvation, but what can I expect from true faith experience now? Can't I expect to experience the power of God in supernatural ways now that I have access to God? Yes, you can. Um, and we're going to be looking at that when we get to chapters 3 and chapter 4. Um, because the supernatural way that you and I experience the power of God at work within us, well, let me just read some of the ways in which um, we will experience his supernatural power at work within us. Chapter 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Um, do not lie to one another, seeing if you put off the, uh, off, have put off the old self. Put on, then, as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, that is the authentic supernatural power of God at work in a person. Not some kind of out-of-body, super-spiritual experience, some uh, encounters with angels and so forth uh, that don't actually bring about any real radical change. Um, when we begin to realize what we are really like, then we will see that the supernatural power of God at work within the believer is the power that produce, pra produces practical, radical change in our behavior and living. And that's why authentic Christian spirituality, again, differs completely 
from all, all these other spiritualities that you come across because God is looking to change us every day in everyday ways as we put off, put on, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. Does this mean, as believing Christians, we're at risk of adding to the gospel with mindfulness, self-help, and things like yoga today? Yes, I think we are. And I think um, this is such a helpful letter for us to be dis- studying because um, we will find people wanting to kind of um, expound spiritual experiences as if they're on the same plane or helpful to add to uh, Christ, the Christian faith that we have. And um, I, I, Paul is going to tell us that it's radically different. What we're going to find when we look more closely at the false teaching is it has a fundamentally Jewish base to it, but it seems to have um, uh, uh, tacked on to that fundamental Jewish base a whole lot of kind of super spiritual experience. Um, and what Paul is going to be showing us and the authentic Christian gospel does for us is say, actually, no, authentic Christian experience tells us we've got everything that we need already. We don't need all this the kind of mindfulness and yoga and all the rest of it, although you might like to do that in order to increase your mobility a little, but uh, we don't need all of that. Uh, what we need to go is to go deeper into the Lord Jesus, uh, and there we will find um, the power for real change. How should we understand Christ, the hope of glory, as the hope laid up for us in heaven? Hope seems to imply a future thing we look forward to, yet 127 says Christ is already in us. I know, I've spent a long time thinking about that. I think chapter 3, verses one, verse 1, helps us most, most, most in this. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so what Paul is wanting us to to see, and we will develop this in the weeks that come, is that the, the work of Christ is so complete, so sufficient so absolute that it is as if we are already now secure with him in heaven. And once we grasp that, that will then drive our everyday faith and love for all the saints. And that makes our spirituality totally different to the sort of things we find um, in any kind of man-made religion, whether it's the self-help religion or whether it's the kind of more formal religion uh, of Judaism, which we will come on to.